Embrace yourself for me. Trust in me will set you free. Let me do everything through you. There is nothing for you to do.
Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Mm. It's beautiful to see you again. <laughs> just beautiful. I was just reading through the uh, list of all the names of everyone who's joining us from around the world, and literally around the world, Germany, Japan, Australia. It's one of our uh, global broadcasts. And, and so there's <clears throat> three of us here in the studio in Mexico, and then Jason is is standing by. Uh, maybe we could do, just uh, do a, a flash Hello. up there. There. Yeah, when I speak, I come up. Hi. There. <laughs> in the brand new studio. You're Not in the yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. After, After Sunday. After Sunday, Sunday we tear this one down. down. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Well, we're just so grateful that you're joining us uh, with this topic because this is a very exciting topic for all of us. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's such a relevant topic. Uh, even as we were sitting here just listening to those, those harmonies uh, of, that were just part of the opening song, you know, I was just I was being reminded by the Spirit, I said, yeah, this is, this is just right off the bat a perfect example of, uh, of being done through because uh, we had, uh, Emily uh, was trained, we had a couple trained uh, opera singers yeah. in there and then Lilo was uh, a Broadway singer, so you're hearing harmonies of glory and, and then uh, Svava took down the song, so the four of them were demonstrating how you can take skills and abilities outside of the professions uh, perhaps for which they were t designed or trained for, the songs, the mm -hmm. voices, uh, but maybe not the songs, I don't know if that song <laughs> would make it on Broadway or <laughs> in, a, in a musical, but actually the voices are coming to us with this beautiful content just as an example right off the bat of, mm -hmm. of being done through. So, to me that's, that's absolutely uh, miraculous, just sitting here listening to that and, and beholding that together. And I see that we have a lot of regulars uh, that are part of our audience and we also have, uh, have some new people here. I see uh, Raul is here uh, joining us from the Netherlands. We met Raoul uh, when we were over there in Holland and uh, mm -hmm. he's also been helping produce a lot of, uh, of Svava's songs for her album. So just as we go on tonight, I hopefully we'll get a chance to, to hear from some of the, the new ones. I see Kenneth there. Uh, he was just down here with us in, in person in Mexico over at La Casa. Yeah. And as they're flipping through the screens, we can, we can see your smiling faces, mm. and it's like we're really gathered digitally in a quantum way. We're all in the same room, so to speak, the room of our mind. And we're here to, to embrace a very, very deep topic. Because this world is like a, a mesmerism. It's what Mary Baker Eddy called uh, this world, it's like a, a mesmerism where we actually believe as we go through our daily lives that we're going through real interactions with real people. Uh, it can seem at times, unless the mind is free of judgment, it, it would seem very stressful. It could seem to bring up anxiety, fear, uh, defensiveness, uh, and basically what we're learning through A Course in Miracles is the mind training of A Course in Miracles, Jesus is telling us is you're, you're seeing a world that isn't even there, you're reacting and responding to shadow figures that are just figures from the past, that are just actually thoughts, it's almost like unresolved issues and grievances in the mind are acted out through people, through characters. Uh, like Shakespeare said, all the world's the stage and everyone must play their part. Well, these, 
these characters that we're perceiving on a daily basis are characters from the past and we're not seeing anything clearly and we're not seeing anything in a holistic way and then we're just reacting and responding to the characters and when we hear this it, it can be like really? I mean that sounds psychotic, you know, that sounds very psychotic reacting and responding to figures that aren't even there. Am I doing this every day? Am I that psychotic? But I think most of us can relate to the metaphor of, um, of going to a movie theater because that, that is uh, probably the, the best metaphor you could ever have for how how the mind is working in this sleeping, deceived state of mind. You know, you, you go into the movie, uh, you sit there in the theater, the projector starts and you start perceiving these characters which are really just shadow figures, they literally are shadow figures, they're just where the film is covering over that bright light in the projector, they are literally just projected shadow figures and how many of us, when we go into a movie, go in, settle in, and then it doesn't take long at all before we're into the story. It's almost like we're there in the movie. We forgot about the theater. We forgot about the projector room. We forgot about everything else and we're wrapped up in this story of, of these figures and images and and we're reacting emotionally to them and some of us will, you know, we, you know who you are, will talk back to the screen. Don't go there, don't get away from him. You know, some of you are talkers <laughs> in the movie theater and if you're not talking, you're thinking it. You know, there's thoughts and reactions and emotions that are going on and then when you leave the theater and somebody says, how how was it? Did you like it? Was it scary? Was it exciting? Did you, was it thrilling? You know, you give your commentary on this stream of images and what your opinion is of this an hour and a half or two hour stream of images. And so what we want to do is we want to go into it so deeply to start to realize that this is the same way that we're living our daily lives. We're just reacting and responding to the beliefs that we hold, the emotions that we feel, the thoughts that we hold on to in an acted out way, like a motion picture of our consciousness and we're reacting and responding and the topic tonight too is also the doer. So the main character, the hero of the dream, uh, for many of us has become the doer of the dream. Mm -hmm. And that doer has a lot of associations <coughs> with it, fear, anxiety, stress, you know. We have things like TGIF, thank God it's Friday because the doer gets to step out, sometimes, <laughs> for some of us, out of, out of the high stress environment and into a more relaxed environment. For some, uh, maybe not so. Lainey is with us too. Lainey is telling us about her, her work life but her, her life with her, with her daughter. You know, it, it can be stressful around the clock as well but, but actually we have to start to realize that, that we've projected a lot of responsibility onto that hero of the dream that is the doer. We take pride in that doer, we have. We, we put a lot of meaning onto that doer, onto that hero. And there's a lot of pressure and stress that comes from projecting that much meaning onto something that doesn't really have any meaning in and of itself. Mm. It's just another image, it's just another, it's like another leaf blowing in the wind, but we've project a lot of meaning there onto that, that character, the hero of the dream. And basically Jesus tells us the serial adventures of the hero is what seems to be what life is all about. 
you know, it's kind of funny when he uses the word serial adventures of the hero of the dream. You know, the first time I read that, I'm, I was just had a big smile on my face and I, I thought, he's talking about my life in almost like a tongue-in-cheek way. The serial adventures of the hero of the dream and I'm, and he says the body is the hero. So that's, that's what the, the personality self is. So we, we're so excited to be with you. We want to welcome you all in and, and really we have great songs and we have amazing uh, expressions here to talk about this <laughs> topic of undoing the doer. And uh, so I think the best way <clears throat> to start off is that you can hear from, uh, from those that are here in the studio with me and hear from Jason because uh, I know everybody is excited about this topic here. This is like a major topic and I think my goal is that we all feel a lot lighter and a lot freer uh, by the end of this, uh, this online retreat. That there's something that has settled in our heart that says, okay, now just relax. <laughs> let's, take the, let's take some of the pressure off of this. So, how shall we start off here? We've got Emily, Kristen here, and Jason. Does anybody feel to lead off with, with your, what's going on? I'd love to hear from Mexico. I, I could share. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking while you were talking, David, that, yeah, I just feel so, so grateful for this community because <clears throat> I was just remembering back a number of years ago before I came to community that I was actually very depressed. I, um, the last few years before finding the Course and David, I was just experiencing a lot of depression and finding it difficult to really find motivation to do anything. And um, I remember at one of the first retreats that I was at, actually Jenny said to me, um, I was talking to her and she goes, wow, you've, you've got a lot of mind energy. It's really important that that's directed in the right way. And that really, yeah, I've always remembered her saying that to me because something about it resonated. Um, just thinking of the rules for decisions section in the course where you know, Jesus says that you're always choosing to align your mind with the spirit or the ego. There's no middle ground, it's one or the other. And when Jenny said that to me about having a lot of mind energy, I started to see, and more and more so as the years went on, that when I directed that mind energy towards the spirit's purpose, my mind was lifted and I would feel elevated and I would feel happy. And when I wasn't in that direction, so being used by the Spirit in a very, very full way, however it might look, my mind would automatically fall back into the ego and that's where the depression came from. Um, I would start to, my mind would be run by these unconscious patterns that I weren't, wasn't even necessarily aware of but that were taking over my mind. It was like the, e the ego hijacked my mind. And over the years of being in community, I've just seen more and more like that this is my pathway. This is practically what works for me to fully embrace in every moment what, what the Spirit is giving me and how the Spirit wants to use me. And in that, I'm aligned with the spirit's thought system and there's no room for these ego thoughts. Actually, well, there's no problems in that. There's no room for, for any doubt thoughts when I'm fully aligned. And then when my mind starts to fall off, it just means that, okay, the focus is gone and it's just to bring it back. So, yeah, I just, I'm just grateful for, for this path with, you know, Jesus talks about uh, everybody has a special function in the Course, and it's not really special in form, but it's the Spirit is giving everybody a function in order to lift their mind and to be aligned with, with their true identity, which is the Spirit. And the, the other thing that came to mind was, um, I was just reading the, 
the beginning of the I need do nothing section in the course and Jesus talks about the body when the ego uses the body it uses it as an end and when the spirit uses it it uses it as a means so the spirits uses a communication device and when we're in that flow and in that function being used in that way we're not identified with the body it's just uh, a tool it's a it's a vehicle to wake us up and but the, the the ego's use is really to use it as an end it wants to uh, do everything in order to keep the body safe to keep it comfortable to keep it secure and for me that's what the doer is and if I'm in that state of mind I'm doing things to try and keep a self-concept alive and a separate self alive and it's um, yeah, it's very stressful, it's very painful, and I'm on the timeline again. And so when, when that efforting and push is coming up, I know that I've, I've gone back into that, into that thought system of using the body as an end, and it's just to pull back and pause and invite the spirit in again and, and, and be used how he would use me as a communication device so, so I can be happy again. So it's, it's so practical, and I'm so grateful in the community here to have so many mighty companions surrounding me because it's it's so helpful to actually know what the guidance is in, in the moment when you're able to join, when you're able to join with those that have walked ahead of you or those who just have that same purpose and to hear what what is it that the spirit would have me do now because we're not always able to get in touch with the with the feeling ourselves, there's so much interference in the mind, but with that purpose out front, we can just be led along the way and following that guidance is going to unwind us more and more from the doer into that experience of just being done through, where there is no personal identity with an agenda. You are just doing what you're doing for, coming from present inspiration in the moment. So, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Mm. That's lovely. Thank you. Yeah, I was just thinking too, kind of playing off what you were saying, Emily, and just the gratitude for the way that the way that things are used in this community. Like in the world, what I used to do is literally work. I worked nine to five in a cubicle, and I mean there were many, many jobs along the way, and many tasks looked like I sat in front of a computer all the time and and now being here there's a new purpose for what I'm doing and as long as I'm connected with that purpose the experiences as you described it's effortless and it's coming from this place of of inspiration I'm doing this for the healing in my mind for a connection I'm aware that that I feel very happy and joyful and as soon as that goes off a little bit for whatever reason a misprompt or anything like that it 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 sucks you back into that old purpose which is where the loop comes in and and uh, yeah feeling grateful for mighty companions as well and so many reflections to help break that cycle um, to, to you know see what you can't see all the time to offer a prompt or what the guidance really is but really I think the way that they've been used for me, and I, I feel very fresh in this, um, like it's very, very present in my mind because this is my present healing. Um, and it's it's been very focused over the last little while. And there was that loop running where there was a forgetfulness of what am I even doing this for? You know, I, I live in this community or I have more than that. I have this purpose in my heart that says, wake up. It's the little voice whispering, wake up, wake up, wake up. And that constant reminder to get in, in touch with something that's beyond the surface level of doing and not doing. Because they're actually, at least in my experience, they're both the same actually. I could be going a mile a minute. Or I could be, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to relax. But I'm going to take a break. And it's kind of like David was saying with the TGIF. Like, when you're in the Spirit's purpose, you don't need a break. Because what are you taking a break from? So... Yeah, there's just been a, um, a real focus that um, has been coming in like a laser, actually, and it needs to be that, um, that direct to 
continue to reinforce a new pattern, which is pausing and praying and stepping back and letting him lead the way. What would you have me do, Jesus? So, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about and kind of amazed at the way that the Spirit can use everything that I would use to reinforce an old pattern and use it in a new way because my mind needs a total retranslation of all of that in order to really understand what it's for. And I was just reading um, a section in the course as well. Uh, I felt like I'd never read it before actually and it just jumped right out at me called The Test for Truth and it talks about um, learning and how basically everything you've ever learned is going to reinforce some filter of the past. You're looking through the past and past learning and it teaches you nothing about the present moment which is beyond the doer. So I'm just really enjoying that lately. Like it's really this breaking down of the I know mind and all of the defenses against the small, still voice that would actually have you live your life out of true inspiration. So it's feeling like very much like an adventure in my experience these past two months, as it's been, you know, more of a focused, a focused assignment to relax, basically, which is kind of amazing. <laughs> she had another little parable yeah. <laughs> I'd like to share. Jason, did you want to talk? Go ahead. And well, just the experience, because you were talking about the music and the experience we've had over the last week um, with myself, Svava, Lilo and Melissa coming together, that, um, you know, Svava has been receiving these songs and, you know, she was saying to me that some of them she, she receives in her dreams. She wakes up and there's a song there. It's like totally given by the spirit. And we had this experience with some of the songs where she would come in and she would start playing and singing the song for the first time and none of us had heard it before. And before we'd heard the song, we started singing in three or four part harmony. It was like we didn't even learn the song. We just learned, we, we heard our part. And it felt so amazing because it was like this telepathic link that we had that was beyond the words, beyond the music. And, you know, it would happen when we would be feeling just very present and connected. There were other days where it was a little bit more dysfunctional and it felt like a bit more of an effort. The doer had come in. But when we were able to step back and get out of the way, it was just like this experience of being fully done through. Like you would just start to feel the sound and you would go with it. And we would all just go to a different note and it would all blend perfectly. So. Yeah, I just thought to share that it was such a beautiful experience. Yeah, thank you. I was thinking with what Kristen was saying about her guidance was to relax because I'm actually up here in Camas and we've been having a lot of talk about apathy versus the strong doer and a lot of jokes and even fun, but but the core of it is that we saw this movie the other night called The Dawn Wall. And uh, yeah, I really enjoy these climbing movies like Maru, Free Solo, and now The Dawn Wall because inevitably you get in there and we watch this movie on the big, big screen in our house and someone says after a few minutes, like, why? Why? Why would anyone climb <laughs> these mountains? You know, what's it for? And I'm like, yeah. Jeffrey's like, total distorted miracle impulse. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's it. But they're like, well, why are you showing this movie? And since I'm working with some people that have a tendency towards apathy, to just, you know, to show a movie like this that shows the precision, the, the collaboration, the holding the ropes, every moment is, if you don't do the right thing, you, you can die, you know, it's like, <laughs> It's, it's this focus that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to share a lesson of, of precision. And, and then, really though, my inspiration is not so much that. So I show this movie and then I kind of laugh when people are like, why, even Ellen, we sh they showed a clip of Ellen congratulating these climbers and she brings them in and she says, so 
first question I have for you guys, congratulations. But why? <laughs> you know why? And I feel like that that is a big part of, of my journey is I was always happy to be doing and be doing everything, but I had to question what what is it for? And being with David in the ministry, I was like a wallflower when I first came in. At least I thought I was. There's no way I was going to speak. And a big part of it was to go out there and share and shine and then at least speak. And, I, you know, Kirsten was with me in the beginning. And I remember there was times where she'd have to, like, poke me to say something. And I would finally have the courage. But then this arrogance came in actually and uh, I thought I knew what I was talking about and hadn't really started yeah David said at one point well you've done the preliminaries and I'm like the preliminaries what are you, what are you talking about I just spent <laughs> seven months on the road talking about the truth the truth and he was like okay well what does that mean if I take it in it means that I need to practically apply all of these things that I've I've been speaking and saying. So I was delivering these profound messages and I felt the effects of it, but it was it was time to apply it. So I I don't know if we'll do it all tonight, but I felt inspired myself to just extend this <laughs> Yeah, this part of um yeah, just what I'm inspired by with undoing the doer and that is what I shared a bit on my live yesterday which is it's actually I found it's in the lesson I'm among the ministers of God so I'll read a few lines and share why it's impactful for me let us today be neither arrogant nor falsely humble we <laughs> I don't know why this We have gone beyond such foolishness. We cannot judge ourselves, nor we need do so. These are but attempts to hold decision off and to delay commitment to our function. It is not our part to judge our worth, nor can we know what role is best for us. What we can do within a larger plan, we cannot see in its entirety. So we can't know our role, and we can't know what it is we're supposed to do. Whatever your appointed role may be, it was selected by the voice for God, whose function is to speak for you as well. Seeing your strengths exactly as they are and equally aware of where they can best be applied, for what, to whom, and when, he chooses and accepts your part for you. He does not work without your own consent, but he is not deceived in what you are and listens only to his voice in you. So that's a lot in that line. Seeing your strengths exactly as they are, so we don't see our strengths as they are. Equally aware where they can be applied, how could you possibly know? If you knew, you wouldn't be directing them into jobs that aren't inspiring, into family situations that there's no loop to get out of. You must have this prayer, like from all of these questions that I'm reading, you know, I spend my whole day and I'm stuck in the cycle. I wake up early, I go to bed, I feed my daughter and I come home all of these things and I'm I'm just thinking wow yeah that's that's that loop he's talking about that we must not know what is best for us and what to say to whom and when those are a lot of variables and so I was saying to some people in this house today that the only person that can know all of that is the Holy Spirit <laughs> so yeah I don't know, I could probably like talk for an hour on this one, so I'm supposed to just give a tiny <laughs> introduction on my feeling. But I'm reading this, and I'm like, this is so good. <laughs> it is through his ability to hear one voice, which is his own, that you become aware at last that there is one voice in you. So, what's passionate about, oh, here it is. It is this joining through the voice for God of Father and Son that sets apart salvation from the world. I feel like I'm going to take too long. <laughs> <It's gonna keep going. laughs> this could probably be the tone thing because I'm getting all these ideas. But the passion, <laughs> the passion for me was 
I've done all of this, like, okay, I feel something to say, I've, I run it through a filter, and then I go ahead and deliver it. And right now, I'm hearing these messages from my brothers and sisters that I have to go deliver, and right away, I don't already, I don't always feel it right off the bat. And there's something in me that knows there's a truth in it, but I don't feel the why or the whom or the energy. And so that's why if we read down a bit, a messenger is not the one who writes the message he delivers, nor does he question the right of him who does, nor ask why he has chosen those who will receive the message that he brings. So I'm being told who to tell this to, I'm being told what to say, and I'm being told by either the spirit inside my mind or my holy companions, you know, what to say. And for whatever reason, it's, there's just like this wall or this block that comes up. But when I go ahead and do it, it's this trippiest thing. Like, I just feel, like, so expansive, so, like, just so much emotion, so much love, so much gratitude. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm doing. And it just reminded me of those early days when I was following guidance. And as I followed the guidance, I didn't know what it was for, and I didn't understand it, but I would receive the benefits after. And a lot of times people will try to figure out, well, what is the guidance for? before they do it. But if you could figure out and understand intellectually what it was for, you wouldn't really need the guidance. It's in the listening and the following that it's so important. So now for me, yeah, just having to deliver these messages, it's like I'm going deeper into my mind and some kind of deeper experience is coming in. So maybe that's enough for now. But yeah, I'm reading from Among, among the Ministers of God. Maybe we'll go into that in a deeper way this weekend. So, thanks for being here, everybody. That's my part I want to contribute this weekend. So. Yeah, we'll probably end up having to do a whole weekend retreat on Lesson 154, I Am Among the Ministers of God, at some point, because it, you could easily do a, an entire weekend on that one, mm -hmm. one lesson. It's just so rich, particularly in terms of guidance. You know, many, many, many course students have a lot of questions about guidance. They know that there's something really important about that. It's not that all course teachers even emphasize guidance. There, there have been teachers that have said, well, you're never actually going to hear guidance in your entire life. <laughs> and, and so the students go, oh, okay, oh shucks. I'll just uh, concentrate on some other things in the course then. But, but really, let's Let's start to look at what Jason was just talking about and why guidance is so important in undoing the doer. Because, <clears throat> let's say you're one of those people that just says, you know, I wish I could consistently have guidance. Yeah, my life would be so much easier. I think I would undo the doer much faster if I was really tuned in to guidance. If I could hear the voice for God very clearly and just follow it. Uh, that would speed things up. And what, from what Jason just read, uh, that, that you can't possibly know what your strengths are, where they're most applicable. Um, there was one time a, a, a man who came to Socrates, remember the, the Greek, a famous Greek teacher Socrates, and, and uh, he went on and on and on, uh, basically telling Socrates that he was enlightened and that he knew everything about everyone and he knew everything there was to know in the whole universe. He said to Socrates, and Socrates just looked at him straight in the eye and he says, do you really believe that you know what is best for every person in every situation? And then that was it. But Socrates just asked the question and smiled and walked away, <laughs> almost like you gotta be, you got to be kidding me, uh, what you're telling me. He didn't buy it for an instant, because it, it is so profound. Now, if we said, we said that about the Holy Spirit, or we said that about Jesus, people might nod and go, well, yeah, that's, that's really what it takes, I guess, to be happy and joyful and peaceful all the time. But let's, just for a moment, look at how it is for most people who are perceiving this world. Most of us are raised, we could say, we have cultural beliefs, we have family beliefs. We have things like morality. We have things like ethics. 
and what are morality and ethics but systems that tell us what the good things are, the good behaviors, and the bad behaviors. Right? I mean, if you don't happen to grow up in a household where guidance is talked about at the, at the, at the dinner table, talked about, you know, are, are you going to, what are, you, are you going to school today? Well, I don't see, I'm, I'm praying on that this morning. Uh, you know, it's like, get out the door, you get to school, walk to school, do whatever you have to do. Uh, do your homework, get good grades, um, and be nice to people. Did, did any of you have a, a mom or a dad that said, just be nice, please, go to school and be nice, be a nice child. What is a nice child? I mean, you know, you're going there and you've got all these emotions going on and all of these fears and, and, and you're supposed to be nice too, on top of it all. What is nice? Well, there are systems of morality and ethics that would tell you what, how to behave nicely, how to behave good behavior and bad behavior. Morality, ethics. And it's pretty confusing because if you travel around the world and you go to different cultures, they have different values. So, like, you know, you're going along, you think you get this thing, oh, that's right, I heard, I, I heard it in the Bible, they told me thou shalt not kill. Mom and Dad tell me thou shalt not kill. And uh, people, my sister, everybody says thou shalt not kill. Then you go to a pygmy tribe, or what are the, what are the, the tribes that eat people? The, Cannibals. You go to a cannibal tribe in Africa and uh, you've got your, your belief system. It's wrong to eat people and the cannibals go, okay, who's for dinner? You know, it's, it's shocking. I mean, you know, you think you've got 90, you think you've got 100% agreement and what? You're at a cannibal tribe and they're, they're saying, who's for dinner? You know, it's like you're just thinking, mama, never told me I'd have this to face this, you know, because you see it's a belief. And so I think a lot of us actually got to the point where we, we want to live a good life. Uh, there was even a, a film producer, did everyone hear of Spike Lee? Spike Lee made a movie called, the title of the movie was Do the Right Thing. Jason mentioned that we want to do the right thing. And most of us go through life, we want to do the right thing. But it's very confusing because you do something and one person goes, that is wonderful, that is spectacular. And then you go around the corner and they, they go, why did you do that? That's terrible. What, no, it just was wonderful. But now I'm around the corner and it's terrible. And then you wonder why you have anxiety when there's no universal agreement in this world on what's the right things and the wrong things. We may have s some things that have some higher percentage of agreement, but there is no universal agreement on anything in this world because there's such a diverse system of beliefs. So then finally you start to think, well, I'm going to have to pick something simpler then. This is too confusing. I'm going to go with the golden rule. I'm going to go with the golden rule from the Bible. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. My grandma talked to me about that, the golden rule. And, you know, for a lot of us that kind of resonates. Yeah, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. But then you get to A Course in Miracles and Jesus starts talking about the golden rule. It's fascinating when Jesus talks about the golden rule because he says, yes, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Only works. <laughs> uh-oh, only works if your perception of both is accurate. You mean my steadfast do unto, my golden rule only works if my perception of myself and others is accurate. And the whole book is telling me that my perception of myself and others is inaccurate. It's inaccurate. I'm now falling back on the golden rule, and he says it only works if your perception of both is, is accurate. So what I'm bringing this up for, and this is what we've been kind of just starting to talk about, is undoing the doer, 
is how can we do the right thing if first of all we don't know what the right thing is and is the right thing the same in every circumstance you know is there something that's that's a behavior that works in every single circumstance and Jesus is saying your perception must be accurate so if this is a world of false perception that's made up by the ego and he does tell us, Jesus says, your behavior comes from your perception. You behave according to your perception. Behavior isn't something that's autonomous, that you, know, you can talk about as a separate thing. Behavior is part of perception. And Jesus is telling us, you react and you respond based on your perception, which is based on your interpretations. And as long as you have egoic interpretations and egoic perceptions, you can't behave in any kind of consistent way. Because your perception is not consistent. If your perception is shifting back and forth between the right mind and the wrong mind, and you don't have consistent perception, and your behavior comes from your perception, then that's why the behavior is so variable. That's why people that even seem to live what some people would judge as kind of a, a nice, normal life, it was going pretty good until they became a serial killer. And then people go, whoops. It looks so good there, up to that point. Kind of normal. But once they cross over the serial killer part, it's like, ooh, criminal, lock them away, lowest scum of the earth. You know, because, because until that perception becomes stabilized, until you come to a place of, of consistent, stabilized perception, which in the ultimate sense is a bit of an oxymoron because uh, right-mindedness or true perception or the happy dream I would say is a mostly consistent <laughs> experience but Jesus is telling us uh, you're not really going to know constancy until you make it back to remembering heaven don't look for constancy in perception perception was made by the ego and it can be stabilized and straightened out but until you wake up from this dream you're not going to know constancy you're not going to know eternity you're not going to know complete wholeness until you wake up from the dream. So I used to do talks about this for many years. I would use the Spike Lee film, Do the Right Thing. And I would say, take the pressure off by seeing that how would you know what the right thing is until you clear out your perception? Because what you do comes from what you think. And if you're thinking sometimes with the ego and sometimes with the Holy Spirit, then your doing is, your doer is going to be pretty uh, unstable. What happens when there's a behavior that we watch of our hero, our hero of the dream, when our behavior, maybe the hero gets drunk or maybe the hero screams and shouts or maybe the hero does some actions and and you think I'm never gonna live this down you know maybe you screamed at your mother when you were seven years old you threw a big temper tantrum and you you, you never really were able to get over that like you still have guilt over that screaming or that disobedience or whatever that behavior was Jesus is saying we have to go into our mind, we have to heal our perception before we're going to find that peace of mind. So in other words, the question isn't how do I do the right thing? The question is think the right thing. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of non-dual teachers that always talk about thought is the problem. Jesus is not actually one of those non-dual teachers. I mean, there are a lot of non-dual teachers that said, just be silent and thinking is the problem. And Jesus says, well, actually, you have real thoughts, <laughs> thoughts that you think with God, and then you have these egoic thoughts. 
So thinking isn't the problem. It's ego thinking that's the problem. <laughs> in fact, who you are is an idea in the mind of God. God thunk you. God thunk you into existence. <laughs> so the next time you go, oh, thought is the problem. I've got to give up thought. If I could just be completely still, I would be enlightened. But thought, oh, I had another thought. And it's not, it's not the thought that's a problem, it's the thinking, the egoic thoughts of time and space. Yes, all time and space thoughts are egoic. So let's, let's put that out there. So in case you, you go, that's a perfect sunset. No, actually, <laughs> the perfection is who you are in spirit, in your mind in the mind of God. That's where the perfection is. So instead of do the right thing, think the right thing, and what would think the right thing be except guidance? What Jason was just talking about. Tuning in, lining up, being ready to deliver the message that I'm to deliver, knowing that the message is first for me, it's always first for the miracle worker, and then you have to also direct where allow Jesus to direct where the, the message is given. In other words, he's not like telling you, go out there and proclaim the love of God indiscriminately. Almost like, like you're firing a machine gun, you know. God loves you, God loves you. <laughs> you know, just trying to really gun down this world with love. Uh, that's not going to do it either. It, it has to be guided. Jesus has to guide you and direct you where to bestow it. He has to tell you what the message is and who to deliver it to. You see where that's going to involve some trust, some listen and follow, some obedience to spirit. And that's going to make this transformation of undoing the doer really accelerate because that's what it's all about. It's not about analyzing behavior. You, if you end up trying to analyze your behaviors or the behaviors of others, you're always going to be using the ego because only the ego analyzes. The spirit does not analyze. I know for a lot of us, uh, that's, a, that's a tough one because all of us have had professions where we were trained, we were educated for many years how to be good judges and how to be good discerning judges of, of what, what's right and what's wrong, and then now we're coming into the Course and it's saying, no, all of your past learning is blocking you from the Holy Instant. And it's, it's equally blocking you from the Holy Instant. You're going to have to let it all go, but the way that we let it go is through listen and follow, is through, through that guidance. So that is a topic that we do raise and we we talk about this and we really have a lot of heart-to-heart -heart talks about guidance. And because we're like fine-tuning, almost like we're tuning into an an antenna of the Holy Spirit and we keep fine-tuning this guidance. We keep running things by each other. We keep really connecting heart-to-heart -heart because we know that, that this guidance is, is so important. The ego put us into this perceptual situation and the Holy Spirit is going to lift us out. It's kind of like the, what was that movie, uh, the, with the fear put me into this prison. But hurricane. 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 Love's going to bust me out. That's it. It's the guidance. It's the guidance through the love that's going to, that's going to lift me to a higher purified perception of the world and then once my perception has become purified, then my actions will flow from that because I will not be reacting and responding to the images of the world. I will be an intuitively flowing. The Spirit will flow through me, through my awareness. And that's where the peace comes in. Isn't that exciting? Isn't it exciting to know you don't have to analyze your behavior? <laughs> you don't. You don't have to buy into that, uh, that Santa Claus song. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. You know, 
it's like most of us have lived our lives based on that song. <laughs> you know, like there's somebody watching over us. We better be good. We better be good. Some people even believe unless you live a good life, like lots and lots and lots of good behaviors, that you're not going to go to heaven. And they have an alternative for that too, which, <laughs> which we're realizing is, is what the ego is. That's why we're here to to raise the ego up into awareness and to see that we don't have to buy into its tricks anymore. This is exciting. We're getting down to the, the, the depth of it all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really amazing because in, in the last two months that I've spent in this focused assignment with the doer, it was very, very clear to me actually that that was the fear underneath. It was actually that I was so afraid to hear what, what it was that would pierce through that, I mean, layers and layers of patterns. And, and it took literally turning my mind, if what it felt like, turning my mind inside out. It was just continuing to what are the thoughts and it, what it looked like practically for me and still looks like I'm in, in this wonderful unwinding with it still but um, I have many many projects here and I had lots of thoughts about projects and I would just hoard them in my mind it was like I would start to like collect things like barnacles and they wouldn't move and Jesus wants me to be free as a channel to be able to as Jason was saying to hear what I am to hear and then to deliver that message ultimately it's a communication function but with all of these barnacles stuck it became this process of like literally what I did was I dumped my mind on paper and I had like 15 pages of paper and then I had this you know sorting out um, of like just basically seeing which ones could immediately be let go of because it was yeah it had just gotten so piled up and then I had this miraculous experience I it was a miracle where one day the papers just all collapsed and before I knew it Jesus had totally taken care of everything so yeah I'm just appreciating what you're saying like it was absolutely a fear of guidance a fear that Jesus would say to me hey why don't you just lay down for a minute or like why don't you go for a walk because it felt like everything's gonna fall everything like my whole kingdom that the ego has seemingly built up in my mind or I'm the overseer of this and I do this like all of this pride was so calcified that the fear was that something would come in to burst that and ultimately that's what the prayer is it's please Jesus yes like help me give all of this over to you help me give all of these thoughts over to you so that they don't have to be stuck in my mind anymore and so through that process uh, through this process that I've been continuing to undergo of just continuing to empty my mind out what are the thoughts what are the thoughts it actually allows movement like there's an actual movement and a continual um, a forming of a new pattern which is whenever that push comes in it's like okay what got stuck you know immediately it's what do I need to raise up actually where did the fear come in what prompt did I not want to follow and that has just been so absolutely practical um, yeah yeah it's been a, a really deep and tremendous time actually like just the amount of things that it amount of uh, determination it's been taking to continue saying again go at it again go at it again it's like the doer repurposed actually it's like using that stubbornness of the doer for actual determination to stay focused and stay moving consistently towards the clarity and it's been yeah it's been really um, a lot of movement <laughs> a lot of movement clearing that's, that's that's like that's where you get your inspiration to to see it and to speak it and to live it and uh, and then if there's any fear that arises fear of the whole bubble popping or fear of something piercing everything and falling away then then you do have to allow yourself to really go into that and face that too because I think if you understand this context that that as Jason was saying the Spirit will give you messages to share and the Spirit knows who that you're going to share them with and and ultimately they're all for your mind for your own mind so it's not like there's anything 
really for anybody else. It's just that you have to allow them to come through. And all of those messages are all about washing away the self-concept, this little self-concept that has been made to take the place of the Christ is going to get washed away. Sometimes when you get into the rhythm with the spirit, it, there's such a strong fast washing that it's almost like there's like a fire hose in your mind and your self-concept is getting hosed down in a rapid way. Some, some people even have it sometimes when they have a drug experience where they, they pierce through the veil of their personality self and suddenly they're everything. They're just the light. And they've always been the light. And they go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I was so wrong. And then they drop back down, <laughs> you know, the ego says, not so fast. And they drop back down into a, a tiny perception. I think back too in my life, I remember I was in academia for 10 years full time. And then after 10 years of academia, when I was in grad school, I suddenly got this prompt that was I, was, I was on a full scholarship. I was a part of a class, the whole classroom of all of us in this program. There was eight of us and I was on a full scholarship. And one day the prompt came in and said, go tell your advisor that you're quitting the program. Quitting the program? Well, it's not only that David was giving the, getting the prompt to quit the program of school psychology, but preceding this, it was David and seven women, and one of the women quit, and then another one quit the program, and then another one quit the program, and there was only five of us in the whole program, and there were four senior faculty. We were all on scholarship. And then I got the prompt that I was to leave this school psychology program, and I was, in my mind, I have to tell you, I, this was before I had the course, I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. Three have left already. It's like a pressure cooker. The professors seem to be feeling guilty, and you want me to leave the program and I was like, this was my prompt. This was part of me leaving something that was very much a part of my identity, part of my self-concept. And <clears throat> for days I sat with that and I just was like, I cannot do that. I cannot. And I was given, no, you're going to go to your advisor and you're going to tell your advisor that you're going to be leaving the program. And so for those next like two or three days, I, I made myself sick, sick, sicker and sicker and sicker. I was going down pretty quick because I was resisting the prompt. It was a, just a very simple prompt. Just deliver this one message to your advisor. And I was like, this was back way before, the, this was back in grad school before the course and I was just like, and then finally I, I just said, okay, all right. And I walked into my advisor's office and I sat down and I told my advisor that I would be leaving the program. And the office next to my advisor was the head of the department. And he heard me telling my advisor I would be leaving the program. And I never heard such rage. I got to see the rage of this elite graduate program where three had already left and I was in there telling my advisor I was going to be leaving, which would leave four professors and four students. <laughs> you know, it was very elite. It's like the second rated school psychology program in, in the United States. So it was, you know, this was like, the, it was the self-concept of David and the whole, the whole program is going down here. You know, if David follows through, but I did follow through. And it's funny, after my, my advisor kind of half smiled, the head of the program raged, raged. You know, Holly probably can relate to this. You're in, you, you know how it is with grad school and going for these. You can only imagine 
you can only imagine what this was like. It was quite a scene. And then the head of the department just raging, you're not good enough. You were never good enough. It was all my doubt thoughts came raging, came out of the head of the department, you know, as I'm sitting there. And yet, when I finally did leave and go, go home, I was like, I did it. I was like, uh, in Brother and Sister Moon, you know, when he finally tells the, the, the king or whatever, throw your scepter in the mud. I, Francesco, I did it. I, when I left, I was, I can't believe I did it. I delivered the message. I felt, whew, I don't even know why I had that prompt, and I don't understand what, what that was all about, but I did it. I did it. And of course, that was the beginning of a big dismantling of eventually, about a year later, leaving grad school, leaving academia behind, and getting into A Course in Miracles, and pouring myself so into the Course that after like two and a half years, I had Jesus speaking in my mind, and He's saying, yeah, well, you're going to let go more than that. You know, if you keep working with me, you're going to let it all go. Uh, you want to wake up and go back to heaven, you're going you're gonna to let it all go. You're going to let go more than just academia. You're going to let go all of your beliefs and your thoughts and your perceptions of who you are in this world so that I can show you that we are the same one, that you are the Christ. And this is part of the dismantling. And, and this goes on even when Jason, when you were sharing, you know, that you had some messages to deliver and you didn't even feel the messages. I didn't feel that I was to go tell my advisor I was leaving the program. I mean, I was like, I put the brakes on. I sent that message back <laughs> to source. It had come back again. I'd say, take it. I'm not leaving this program. You know I'm on scholarship. Here it is again. Take it back <laughs> for like three days. <laughs> Here it is. Take it back, you know. But I had to give in. I had to give in, and all of us, that's just an example from the parable of David where it was a prompt that I, I actually could not refuse. And, and all of us have to be willing to take those prompts and really go with them and, and say, this is, this is important. Yeah. Just coming up to... Um this retreat, the section um, in the Manual for Teachers, uh, what is the real meaning of sacrifice? It was really strongly in my mind. And, and I feel like that's the fear under following the guidance. Like there's such a deep belief in the mind of sacrifice. Like if I were not afraid of the means, we're afraid of the end. Like it's not actually the prompt that's scary but somewhere in our mind we know where it's leading. We know that eventually we have to let go of everything. And it's such a beautiful section because Jesus says, you know, what sacrifice could it be to give up nothing and gain everything? And that really it's a trick in the mind. Like the sacrifice, you're already in sacrifice when you're in that state of mind, when you're in the ego or the doer. And the release from the sacrifice is to follow the prompts, but the, the, the ego has totally turned it upside down and puts the sacrifice off in the future. If you follow, you're going to sacrifice. So I think it was strongly in my mind just because I think that for me, the doer is a defense over that belief in sacrifice. Like the doer is what comes in and says, it's okay, God, I got it. You know, I'm, I'll take it from here and thinks it knows how to be safe, but it's like a pseudo safety. It's not, it's not real, but yeah, it's just a total defense over that surrender point of just listening and following and, and being unwound. And I remember, David, you said to me once, I was saying something about sacrifice, and you said, yeah, the ego is terrified of letting go of the belief in sacrifice. And that's what it is. It's not a real thing. But the ego sets up all of this stuff so that we don't just see it's a belief in our mind that we could be free from. So. Yeah. That's a, it's a very common thing, this belief that if you're on the spiritual journey, God is going to require you to sacrifice so many things. You're, 
that you know we all have heard stories of people they oh they listen to the voice for God and then they're out walking in the desert on the sand all alone tracking their way through the you know these these images are conjured up in our mind of like oh my God what will become of me and what will God ask of me and then when I actually when you really look at the questions, you know, we always ask you to write in the questions, you know, whether it's uh, Esther talking, you know, we've communicated over the years of what will become of me with, with my therapist, um, or uh, the financial support that I receive uh, from the government, whether it's um, Lenny, uh, Talk, Lainey talking about too, you know, with, with your child, with your family, you, what you described as the struggle, the daily struggle. That's, it's like a cycle of doing, stuck in a loop of things that need to be done. There's this belief in lack in the mind. It's what the ego is. It's just a belief in lack. And then it gets projected to the world. And then the dream of Lenny all of a sudden, Lainey's dream is, is, seems to be pressurized. Like, it's wake up in the morning, shower, brush your teeth, and thus it begins. A high pressured system of having to do one thing after the next. Almost like fulfill one thing, then the next, then the next. Getting your daughter ready for school, you know, this, getting to work, and one thing, and the next, the next, the next. Then you come home and you're hit with another thing, and then another, and another. And then you have A Course in Miracles, which is basically saying, what if you made it all up? What if this entire dream, this entire perception of your daily life is made up? That's kind of an interesting idea, like, like fiction, make-believe. And then we have the beautiful passages from the Course where, like I was talking about at the very beginning, um, where basically Jesus says, each one peoples his world with figures from his individual past, and it is because of this that private worlds do differ. Yet the figures that he sees were never real, for they are made up only of his reactions to his brothers and do not include their reactions to him. Therefore he does not see he made them and that they are not whole. For these figures have no witnesses being perceived in one separate mind only. So, you know, you hear me talk about quantum physics and we, the quantum field and, and holistic perception and, and the mind, like everything is the mind, everything is consciousness. And when you have an amnesia and you forget this vastness, then all of a sudden it's like you're back in that movie theater and you're watching that movie, and they seem to be real concerns, real people. Oh, I don't want to let that one down. I better not let that one down. I can't let the boss down because I'll get fired. I can't let my husband down because my husband might walk out, say here. I can't let my daughter down. I can't let my course group down. I can't let down my family. Wait a minute. This is all projection of fear and lack in the mind. And I have to get down to that fear and lack and see the impossibility of the sacrifice, the impossibility of the belief in lack. Why would God create lack, you know? Why would total love and abundance, oh, I think I'll create some lack and guilt today, make up time and space. You know, God's, God is not the author of fear, but it has to be exposed in the mind. And then at one point, in that same page I was just reading from, he says, As you look with open eyes upon your world, it must occur to you that you have withdrawn into insanity. That's right. That's what this world is, insanity. It's like it must occur to you that you've withdrawn away from the light and into a world of total insanity. Like psychosis to the max, schizophrenia to the max. Psychosis is a break from reality. This is, this world is a break from reality. Heaven is reality and this world is definitely a break from reality. Schizophrenia, are you hearing multiple voices? 
If you're hearing all these voices of these people and they seem to be pulling you in different directions, do the right thing. Feed me. Help me. Do this for me. Do that for me. All these, that's schizophrenia. You're listening to multiple voices instead of just one voice. You see what is not there and you hear what makes no sound. Your manifestations of emotions are the opposite of what the emotions are. You communicate with no one and you are as isolated from reality as if you are alone in all the universe. In your madness, you overlook reality completely and you see only your own split mind everywhere you look. God calls to you and you do not hear, for you are preoccupied with your own voice. And the vision of Christ is not your sight, for you look upon yourself alone. So basically, the reason we're talking about undoing the doer is because that perception of yourself as just a human being, you know, like that song, you're only human, born to make mistakes, nonsense. <laughs> that is not the truth. <laughs> you were, are not human, born to make mistakes. You are a mind waking up to its true nature. You are a, a soul that's beginning to know thyself. You are opening to guidance so that the, the spirit can move the puppet that is the body and speak through that puppet and sing through that puppet like we heard today and, and let the puppet be used to hug and to bless and to smile and to laugh and to love in a way that frees your mind like uh, Morpheus was talking about in The Matrix. I'm here to free, he tells Neo, I'm here to free your mind. That is your mission. Should you decide to accept it? <laughs> your mission, this tape will self-destruct in 10 seconds, but your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to free your mind from the tyranny of ego beliefs. Your mind was, you were never meant to believe in the ego. You were never meant to take its images on the screen serious. They seem to be quite serious when you believe in them, and yet there will come a point where you will laugh. You will laugh at this world. You will have a belly laugh. And you will laugh so hard, you will say, I, I can't believe I ever took that that serious, where things will happen to you that will even could seem crazy by the world and you will just laugh so hard you will not be able to stop laughing because you realize that it, it has no reality. It doesn't cause you to be who you are. That, that's from the Matrix. Remember when Neo is down there in Trinity and Morpheus are in the, that black car with the doors open in the funny, funny way, they're driving along the street, and and basically, Neo's asking, "What does it mean?" And and Trinity tells him, "The Matrix cannot tell you who you are. This world cannot tell you who you are. You have a divine source, and that's why we're having this gathering right now, is to activate." that source, that spark of light inside of you and let that grow and grow and become so bright that the shadows, the darkness is, is shined away. And we're not only going to talk about this with these kind of teachings, but we're going to actually use the parables. The parables of Jason, the parables of David, the parables of Emily, the parables of Kristen, to share what we've gone through, what we've witnessed as, as our mind is loosening up. Francis Zhu, some of you know Francis, Francis came to me a couple days ago and she had tears in her eyes. I was sitting in my office and she walked in the door and she had tears in her eyes and I said, what's, what's happening with you? And she said, 
I just went through my Facebook account and all the memories back like years ago and it just was a, a montage of photographs of way back before she was into the course and all of this and and then all the way through to all these bursting photographs of of joinings and happiness and joy and laughter and she was just filled up with just such huge gratitude and she came into my office and she said I can't believe my life actually turned out this way considering where I was you know she was a, had her self-concept life and now the way she watched through all the montage of the photos of how she was like lifted up in the light and used in ways that she couldn't even imagine being used and she could see them all you know how you, it's like a rush when you see a, all those photographs you know and it's just the flood of all these photographs it just was reminding her so strongly that oh my gosh I'm escaping the matrix I can see it in the Facebook montage that that woman that was Francis is has gone through such a transformation of being done through for all these years that that things have fallen away house that she owned gone husband that she had gone business that she had gone and yet traveling speaking making a movie laughing you know that's some of the best times that we have where we'll just be at the temple and talking and then Lisa gets into one of her Lucille Ball episodes and then just to listen to Francis roar laughing she just roars laughing and this little Chinese woman laughing and laughing she can't stop laughing she's laughing she's laughing and Lisa's doing all of her faces her Lucille Ball faces and and Francis cannot stop laughing that's where this is heading in your life you know in the end, you know, we forgot to laugh at the ego and in the end we're going to have a really big belly laugh. It has to be so. It has to be so. There's no other way to go. It's the only way. That's a Mary Poppins song. The only way is up. The only way to go is up. From Mary Poppins Returns. That's the, the latest movie. How are we doing? Are we ready to open it up for some uh, some hands? Here we go. Let the hands fly. <laughs> okay. Well, the first hand up is Adriano. Go ahead, Adriano. Hi, David. Hi, everyone. Um, I was remembered uh, my difficult uh, because I can I can observe quite well my thoughts or my action and uh, um, the past I mix up this observer with the controller. No? Uh, uh, to control uh, my thoughts or my actions, for example. And then come um, this thought, thought that uh, when I observe my mind, my thoughts, there are uh, many levels of thoughts. Most uh, uh, when I observe uh, it's at the same time and uh, a lot of then evil thoughts I can say so no? and uh, somehow I was all, uh, I don't trust all the, the sweet thoughts or the good thoughts because I think that uh, the ego or the uh, separate or the set Saturn eh, speaks all, also uh, sweet, and then I block it everything. 
and then um, it came to me né, this, this fear to lose it is a controller né? to control uh, 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 my thoughts or control my uh, my my action and uh, I came to the conclusion because I have uh, my gross uh, my my biggest fear of of guidance to be off to be open to the guidance to to be total open is a uh, the fear to lose the control, to, to control of myself or, the, or this, uh, um, yeah, you know, exactly here. Yeah. That's why I I I I, I, I block all the the, the clients because somehow I know when I open it. I lose uh, uh, Adriano, I lose myself. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yes, uh, it's beautiful that you realize that though, Adriano, because um, what you just did there in that, in that minute that you described it, you know, you, you are describing the dilemma of what we call in 12 steps, it's the serenity prayer. You know, the whole serenity prayer comes down to control. What I can control, what I cannot control, and the willingness to know the difference, you know, the willingness to be guided. And so the ego has convinced the sleeping mind that in order to live, in order to have life, you must control. You know, you must control your time, uh, you must control your finances, you must control your environment, certainly your immediate environment, even if you say, I can't control the politics of my country or I can't control the weather, there's still an ego belief you must control many things to, to live, to actually to live. So control to the ego is life. And that's why the serenity prayer is, in the end, it's a, it's a prayer of surrender. Uh, the healing occurs in the surrender of that control. Or like Emily was saying, you know, it's like sacrifice is just a, is really a belief. It's not real. In, God didn't create sacrifice, but, but it's so deeply believed in that even when you start to have a glimmer, like maybe there's guidance, maybe there's help, maybe there's a higher power that can, can get me out of this mess, the ego screams bloody murder, like, no, that'll kill you. You'll lose yourself. You're going to lose Adriano uh, in order to heal. And, and that's, that's the, how the split mind is dealing with that. The ego is always saying, don't, don't let go, don't trust, you know, don't, don't believe, don't hope. You know, it's very much just, just maintain control because it tells you that that's life itself. So, for me, I had to realize how wrong I was about that belief. I had to realize that I was, I believed it too. And, and yet I had to be shown through many, many miracles how, how absurd, how ridiculous it was to try to control, you know, the, most of us have, we go through many years of, ed of education, we have our parents teaching us, you know, how to, how to control ourselves and, and how to con control the world, and we get lots of educations, and then we have a whole career that teaches us how to control and manage everything. And when somebody tells us we can let go, uh, the ego says, that's foolish. That person is completely foolish. You know, you let go, you die, is basically uh, what we're dealing with here. So I think these online retreats, and when we start to listen to each other, like what, what we've gone through, very much like in a 12-step in a meeting, I know people who, who have struggled with addictions for years, 
And then they go to their first 12-step meeting and they're in the same room with 25 other people. And the first realization they have when they're in that room and listening to those other 25 people talk about this stuff is they go, hmm, I thought I was the only one. The whole room is full of my issue. <laughs> They've all got my issue. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? I thought I was the only one in the universe and now I've got 25 of them and they all have 25 control issues going on here <laughs> in the same room. I have to tell you another funny story is that when I was in graduate school, <clears throat> I took a counseling class and then the counseling class had us do counseling sessions and they recorded our counseling sessions and then they gave it to the teacher, to the professor. And I don't know what I said in my counseling thing, but I probably sounded a little bit like Abraham Maslow or something like, I don't believe that this world can control me. I'm not going to give in to the forces of this world of, of job and family and relationships and, and I'm going to be free and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make my decisions and I'm going to learn how to make such beautiful decisions in my mind that I will not be at the mercy of any person, place or thing and I will transcend this world. I don't know what all I said in my counseling session. They recorded it and then they gave it to the professor. And, and the, I was talking about intrinsic locus of control. It's all a state of mind. It's all our choice and there's nothing outside of us that can bring us down. And they handed it to the professor and the professor said, this guy David has major control issues. I didn't think, I mean, I, uh, I'm saying that I could control my state of mind, that I could choose to be happy, that, that nothing in this world could stop me. And then when it got recorded and turned into the professor, the, they said I had a control issue. So, you know, it's, here's a good line from A Course in Miracles that will help you, Adriano. Jesus does say that you can learn to control the direction of your thinking. You can actually learn to control the direction of your thinking. Now, in a split mind, there's only, what, two directions. One of love and one of fear. And here's Jesus Christ, an awake mind, that is saying you can learn to control the direction of your thinking so well that you can actually reach a state of mind where you can refuse to let an ego thought enter your mind. Wow! Now that's a definition of control that I like. That you have the power, your God-given mind is so strong that you can control the direction of your thinking so well that you can actually not allow an ego thought to enter. That's amazing. Only an awake mind would use control in that way. That's like the, that's the most positive use of control that I've ever heard. And he's, he's talking about it in terms of mind training. That's the most positive use of control. He's not saying control the images of the world or control the script. He's just saying control the direction of your thinking and realize how powerful you are as God created you. Isn't that amazing? Yes! <laughs> now that's the kind of control we're going for. Mind discipline. Yes. <laughs> Smiling face of Adriano and Jesus right beside you over your Right shoulder. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> oh, sweet. Yay. Up next is Asuka. Go ahead, Asuka. Hello, David and everyone. 
K from Japan. Hello. Hi. Hi, Eska. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, I want to make it clear that actually I work from 9 to sometimes 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. As, as an English instructor. And actually, I love my job. But I sometimes feel that um, I am not serving God fully. I mean, but actually by listening to your talk, about control or other things that I feel that behavior is not the problem, but my thinking is the problem and I can choose the Holy Spirit instead of ego, no matter what I do. So even though I work or I live so-called a normal life, but still um, I don't have to feel guilty but I just keep doing what I'm feeling happy and with the Holy Spirit is my understanding correct or am I going the right direction I just want to make it clear mm. yes you you teach by demonstration and you teach by attitude and if you are even working from 9 in the morning to 9 at night and you're happy and you love your pupils, and you can't wait to see them expand and grow, and, and you feel this joy, then that's what you're teaching. You know, that's, that is your curriculum, is, is your mind. And, and then, how beautiful that you can just give yourself so fully to that, and then, of course, you just continue on with that, while you feel the love and the joy, you know, there, there's no sense of trying to control be, the behavior or to map out your career or to figure out the world, but just by radiating that happiness, you know, that is, is your gift. And there's a, there's a purification that happens that way, you know, when we really f fully give ourselves over to something to be used in that way, it doesn't matter you know what what's being done you're you're teaching english and and it's and there's a blessing in that and also your when i when i came over there with francis you know all your hours and hours of translations and then all the faces lighting up in the room and all the hugs and kisses and photographs and and all the joy that was there you were a huge part of of that so even then, you just gave that skill over to the Holy Spirit and, and said, here I am, use me. So it's so beautiful. That, thank you for sharing that, because that's exactly what we're teaching here. It's, it's, it's to really go for the happiness in your mind from following the Holy Spirit and not trying to make some kind of a formula in terms of the world. There is no formula to be happy. It's other than listen and follow. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> okay, next up is Apple. Go ahead, Apple. Uh, so, my, my actual name is Michael, um, it's my wife, <laughs> Katie and I. Um, I actually initially had a question, I, I'm changing, um, Asuka actually inspired me a little bit. Um, so, I actually came from a, a situation, <laughs> you laugh? <laughs> uh, I came from a situation where I was in school, um, not that long ago, maybe like five months ago, and um, it was a situation that was pretty intense in the sense that uh, I was getting screamed at a lot by my supervisor and it generated a lot of this fear inside me and it's kind of carried over over those so I, I just got a job a few months ago and um, the job itself is not that stressful um, but I sense this fear it, like, it comes back all the time 
and it's it's not it has nothing to do with the job itself. It's like this this conditioning that happened while I was in this um, supervisory role in my uh, while I was in school. And so, like sometimes when I go in, it's like my my ego is just like it it wants to get out of it. It just it, it at least that's what it feels like. And like that's what I'm trying to discern: is it like is it the ego that wants to get out, or is it, like sometimes the Holy Spirit? Because like I've gone on this alternative route where I'm kind of doing like my own art and trying to you know make a living off that, and then it's actually bringing a lot of light. And my my wife and I are kind of like collaborating with it. And so like there's a part of me that's like, is it does the Holy Spirit want me to go you know more more towards the art route or is it just kind of trying to get out of a sticky situation with the with the ot because like i do feel a lot of light sometimes with the ot um and it's only when my, i feel like my mind gets in the way that um that i get myself into trouble i don't know it's kind of messy so i was just kind of like gonna spit it all out and see what you thought of it <laughs> <laughs> beautiful thank you thank you yeah i feel like um for everybody in terms of of what the, like Aska inspired you because she has so much love in her job and I think in our in what we do in terms of our vocation and also in terms of our relationships we there there has to be a core of of love a core of motivation of love because uh, I realized in the parable of David that there was a certain point where I was looking at my behaviors and I was saying, I am motivated by fear of fear of consequences. That's why I, I take jobs that I don't love uh, and, and do things that I don't like, or even find myself in relationships that seem, seemed very dark and everything. I thought, wow, that's, that's my mindset. I'm actually motivated by fear of consequences. If I don't do this, then this will happen. You know, all this false causation. And once I started to realize that, that I did have love within me and I could be motivated by that, you know, I could really start to go in deeper into my heart and find and connect with that love and that that would activate my skills and abilities. And, and it was more like, let love use my learned skills and abilities and build a confidence and build a momentum and then in that momentum of course I would still have to face you face something here or there around the corner you know you're gonna meet people even if you sell art like uh, here we are in Mexico there's so many people that they just do what they love I, I'm surrounded by people here they want to open a restaurant they get a grill and they get some chairs and table and right in the middle of the street or the side of the street they open their restaurant they don't pay any rent they just roll out the, the grill they put out some chairs and tables and they love to cook and they're cooking up all this meat and and all these people start coming off the streets and they've got a little restaurant going there they're not paying any rent you know this be out of their the love of it you know very simple. So I think you're on the right track where uh, if you find something that, that you feel like inspires you and you feel the swirl of love happening and, and even that collaborating with your wife and, and you feel it's a connecting, joining thing for both of you, that, that feels like a real good movement. And, and there will still be pockets of unconscious darkness that will come up just for healing but you want to be in that momentum of the love you want to to feel like you're being carried by the love so when those unconscious thoughts come up that you can can face them you can join hands together and you can say listen we're not I'm not going to buy into this you know we're we're being lifted up here I'm not going to let this this particular supervisor or this particular thing that comes my way, it's not going to uh, stop me from, from being who I truly am. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wonderful. They're going Next for it. <laughs> Marianne Peterson. Go ahead, Marianne. Come on, Jonas, it's you. Hello. 
um, sharing this is, is really scaring to me because it, it's, it's like letting go of my whole identity. Um, I have been studying drums for the most of my life and I've been playing in a band that is now achieving some kind of success in the world. And I have felt a prompt to leave the band. It, it feels like the guys I play with, they are not into spirituality um, and they have like an agenda like we meet early, we work efficiently and we just work and work and work and I feel there is no time for guidance. And I've been, I've been frustrated and I've just felt this prompt to, to leave, but I, I can also see that playing concerts is a great opportunity to extend love. And I really just want to, I want to be out there and extend love with people. And part of my pattern is that I, I kind of tend to hide away. So I can see how this could be an egoic trick to keep me away from people, to, to say no to this band. And then, of course, there is an immense guilt of leaving my friends since they are just about to have success and the record is coming out in a couple of months and stuff. So, yeah, I just wanted to spit it out and hear your thoughts. Okay. Is this, am I speaking to Jonas? Yes. Jonas, you know, I have been feeling you in my mind a lot because, uh, and I've heard that you're quite a, a, an excellent drummer. And uh, there's another friend of mine, you're over there in, in Denmark, another friend of mine that's starting to is travel pretty soon with, with Ricky, uh, Micah, who's also a drummer. And you heard the voices at the beginning of this song. Three, uh, three of them are from Europe. And so I'm, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are just helping me get a new center started in Europe, in uh, Spain. And I've been saying probably for the last year, or I don't know how long, to Emily about a girls band. But they have great voices. But of course, Emily can play the keyboards. Slava plays the guitar. Uh, Lilo can play the guitar. And they have spectacular voices, but they really are in need of some <laughs> instruments. Uh, I know that would be a hard job for you to be with a girls' band and be the drummer, the Ringo of, uh, of a girls' band, but I can actually feel it happening, you know? And I've actually, in this, this center that's going to be over there in Spain, I actually was walking through the casitas, and I came into this one casita, and I looked around and I said, this is a recording studio. <laughs> this is a recording studio for the band. So I know, I just feel your heart, Jonas, and I know it, that you're, you're part of a great band. We just recently here went to see Bohemian Rhapsody, and we were, all our hearts were just expanded of watching uh, Freddie Mercury and Queen come together and with all the different personalities, and boy, did they hit it big. Uh, but they had to go through a lot of healing, and I, when we saw Bohemian Rhapsody, I was thinking, there it is, it's, it's the girls' band again, it's coming in, <laughs> we've got all these voices, even tonight, Ricky's not even here, but she's, you know, she's another one that's coming over to Europe, she's flying over there in March, so I, I have a feeling that there's, the Holy Spirit has got something cooking, uh, that your skills and abilities, it's not going to be like you're sacrificing anything, but I have a feeling like it's something big is, is coming that's going to be like when the Beatles came together, when the Feb Four came together, <laughs> boy did that shoot light out all over the, the whole globe uh, for years. And you never know. We don't think, like Eska was saying, we're not thinking kind of in terms of the boxes and thinking that it has to look a certain way. We just know that there has to be a, a way for that love and joy to come through in that light of the Spirit. So, here you are, you, you spit it all out, that's what, I, what I'm hearing is, I think your skills are going to be used, those drumming skills are going to come in really handy for Jesus. <laughs> Beautiful.
That's that no sacrifice thing. Exactly. Like, what, are, what will I leave behind? Mm -hmm. We're going to be so lifted up that, that that question will not be in there. Like, what, what did I leave behind? <laughs> yeah, I thought I left singing behind. It was like a long road of pursuing a career as an opera singer and but it just I in the end my my voice got shut down because I, I think I I'd identified with the doer I was trying to do it myself and I ended up the spirit guided me to drop it all and then has guided me to pick it up again and initially I actually had a lot of resistance because it was so much past conditioning but over the years, the spirit has worked very gently with me and you know, brought in all of these other musicians and singers and people who are inspired to sing together or whatever it might be. And I just feel like it's, yeah, like it's opening my heart up. And like you were talking about guide, guidance earlier, like we don't always know what's in our best interest. And I thought that singing wasn't anymore. It's like somewhere in my mind I'd made a decision, I'm not going there again, like that part of my mind. And the spirit was so patient, just bringing the symbols in over and over again. And now I can see the fruits of it. I can see the experience of, you know, the peace and my heart opening up and the joining and the collaboration. But I never would have been able to see that myself. I had to trust what was coming yeah. towards me. Yeah, that's so beautiful because because the, the shift, I mean, even you, as you join with Jason, as you join with those around you, you drew Jason's voice out. You know, it's like it, there was a lot of collaborations. So the witnesses started to come around. And then, and then with Marion, Dora, and, and with Netta, the voice liberation, it just started to come in very overtly, like, oh, I'm going to use your voice in very specific ways. And uh, yeah, and Francis's new movie coming out. Soren, Soren's a star. Like, oh, I just saw it, and I thought, oh, he's gonna, go get that movie at Cannes Film Festival, and they're gonna walk down the street. There he is, because this new movie that Francis made is coming out, and there's voice liberation uh, in action right there in the movie. So uh, I think that's that's what we're really telling everybody. You, you may have skills and abilities that you've identified with in a professional way and certainly with Emily you know with training to be an opera singer you know it's a, it's years of of dedication and devo devotion and voice training and then and then it's it takes almost like a a detachment from it for a little bit so that it can become come in in a new way uh, and be used in a completely new way because most people when they have highly developed skills their identity is so tied into those skills when actually that has to loosen up and then the most glorious miracle comes in when you find yourself being, in your case, Jonas drummed through or sung through. Uh, it, it's spectacular and, and, and you're lifted up in, in ways where you feel your consciousness expanding, your awareness expanding and you know, okay, this must be of the Spirit because I couldn't have possibly planned for this, but yet it's happening. Yeah. It's, oh, it's precious. Kirsten and Jackie are heading your way over there. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Jeff, I think maybe we, we have time for one more, unless, do we have anybody who wants to do a little undoing the do or wrap up or? <laughs> <laughs> do up, do up, do up. No, we'll just. <laughs> well, Carly does have her hand up, and um, we can certainly let her speak. Yes. Go ahead, Carly. Hi. Um, yeah, I've just been feeling like super depressed um, in my life, like just and not really very tuned in, like with guidance and Holy Spirit and like right mindedness and um, and a lot like 
of things have come up like around work and everything like that. Like I took a couple jobs um, to try to do something new and then I quit like pretty quick after I took the jobs and kind of got sort of freaked out um, by doing maybe something new. And then I had a lot of feelings come up about like being trapped there and, um, and being terrible at the job that I was assigned to do. And, um, and so now I've just been like in this in between period where I uh, don't have another job yet, but I might get one soon. Like it keeps kind of being postponed a little bit to like tell me if I got the job or not. And, um, yeah, I've just been feeling like super lost about like what the spirit would have me do in my life, you know? And, um, yeah. And like, just a lot of thoughts, like this can't be how it's supposed to be, you know, like kind of a thing, like, and like feeling like I'm just uh, failing and doing everything wrong. <laughs> um, and there's a big belief in my mind, like strong or belief about like the behavior, you know, like doing something wrong, making a wrong choice, um, that kind of thing. So that's been coming up quite a bit. And um, so, yeah, I, I guess as people were talking, though, I was kind of feeling like certain things were highlighting in my mind a little bit, like, you know, about things being used. And in fact, uh, my mom just asked me today because her neck was hurting her. And so I gave her like a little mini massage, you know, and I didn't even think about that <laughs> as far as being used. You know, it's kind of like, OK, well, I guess I'll give her a little massage. And I mean, it's like my heart's just not in in it. So it's like I didn't even realize it at the time, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess I just have like a prayer about maybe just, I don't know, just coming back to my right mind, like feeling like connected again, not separate, not feeling like I'm just wrong and like failing and <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Carly, we, we love you so dearly. Actually, um, it was some days ago where Jenny just forwarded me um, what you had written and you just, it was like an expression session, you just poured your heart out of, of the darkness and, and after you uh, left the monastery there last October and then went back and it seemed to shut down, but you know, I could just feel your call for love and that's the way this works. You, you reached out, you poured your heart out to Jenny and then Jenny sent it to me, and and then uh, just recently too, I was uh, I was watching this new movie that's coming out with Francis, and then uh, there was a scene, and there you were, your face was just sparkly in the kitchen, you were there in the in the movie, and I said, oh, there's Carly in the mystery school, and the mystery school is so deep that that you kind of. Ex plunge down and expose so much. I mean, I was there with you in that TP where even you, you even stopped breathing for a while, but you, all kinds of things move through you. This is such a deep journey of healing. And I just remember um, saying when Jenny showed me that, I said, that's Carly, she's, she's one of us. She's part of us. She's, um, she needs to be on this online retreat. And then seeing you at the mystery school, I remembered parts from the Course where Jesus says, doubt will go, will come and go and go to come again. Um, there's another part in the Course where Jesus says, as you move toward the light, you will rush to darkness. He uses those words, rush to darkness, like there's such a terror in the mind of the light and you ha have giving yourself so open that at times you're like a channel and the Spirit and Jesus is just pouring through you so strong, like a perfect translucent channel for Spirit and you're receiving all that. You're receiving like a, a tractor beam of light and then the ego just recoils, absolutely recoils at it and that's where the, the big uh, shutdown occurs. But I just want you to know that, you know, that you are so with us and 
and I feel you is very much a part of us, that, that you've come into our lives and, and the, there's so much purpose and meaning to that because you have a gift, you have a gift and, and when it, the world comes back, you know, you know, like that Josh Groban song, you know, it's, don't give up, you know, it's just the weight of the world. I really feel with you that you have these expansive openings and then it's the weight of the world, the ego just tries to cr come crashing in and, and just points out to the screen and say, oh, look, look at yourself and look what your daughter's, oldest daughter's going through and your husband and, and your family. And it just tries to flood your mind with all these witnesses to say, you can't be the Holy One because look at your life and yet, you know, you're doing it for them and you're doing it for everyone and when you expose that darkness and, and you know that you have this very deep function and it just won't go away and uh, you know how earlier I was talking like I, I was so identified with grad school and grades and pleasing my parents and pleasing my professors that when that one day when I was just sitting there and I got this prompt, leave the program, that was just like, oh, come on, you've got to be kidding me. But no, Spirit wants to lift us up into, like that song, Lo Love Lift Us Up to Where We Belong. And, and I really feel that. So for you to, to just crack open and pour your heart out, and, and write that email, you know, that, that was such a big step because the ego doesn't want us to even do that. It just wants to, us to hide and it wants to sh shut the curtains and shut the doors and, and isolate. And, and you have so much to give that I just, I just felt so strongly you were to be part of this online retreat because it's like, you know, we, I haven't forgotten you, we haven't forgotten you, you know, you've been with us and to come through a mystery school of four weeks of, of dismantling and then eventually to go back and then the ego will try to come in, say, okay, well, okay, round one goes to Holy Spirit, I'm gonna come back with a vengeance and try to take you out in round two. But, but don't give in to that, you know, we're, we're here with you and you write to us and you call us and you call our counseling hotline and, and you keep that in your mind to stay linked with these online retreats and Sunday shows and allow that nurturing and that love and light to support you because you have a very important function and we love you so dearly. I'm just so happy to see you. Oh, oh, wow, that was an amazing session. Mm. <laughs> well, Jason, why don't you wrap it up from up there in, in the... <laughs> this could be one of our last uh, sessions in that old studio, so <laughs> better... <laughs> <laughs> Use it well. <laughs> Look at the flower there too. It's it's a prop. So. <laughs> we were just singing, love lift us up where we belong. <laughs> Eagles fly. On a mountain high, <laughs> where we belong, far from the world below, where the free winds blow. Oh, so sweet. Oh, that's so great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us. Mm. 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 There's Raul and Lisa over there in the Netherlands. 
I'm glad you joined us. Alexandra and Brian. Alexandra and Brian, hey. yeah. There they are. Richard They're, in Canada. Yeah. Sarah. There's Kenneth with his ear earbuds on. Yeah. <laughs> Kenneth, I I just heard it. I just saw the letter you sent. You're you're going to be making furniture for us for our monastery. Beautiful outdoor furniture. Wow. What a gift. What a gift. We love you, Kenneth. We love you. You're activating. <laughs> you're activating that part. <laughs> you're being done through. <laughs> Beautiful. Your Holy Spirit given function. Oh, what a joy. Yes. Mm. And Sarah up there and Helena, mm. Elias and Serena. Serena. Mm. We see you. <laughs> Esther. Mm. <laughs> Stephen. Christine and David. Mm. Oh my gosh. All the beloveds. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's about 79, 80 people from around the world. We're <laughs> all joined mm. in mind getting lifted up. Sue and Rich down there in Australia. Colin. <laughs> Patrick. Yeah, Carol. Steven. <laughs> oh, love you, Patrick. <laughs> Wait, where is it coming from? <laughs> wow. Well, we'll see you for the next session. We'll yeah. see you for the next one. We've only just begun. <laughs> <laughs> mm.